Welcome to the La Casa de Cristo sermon cast. This sermon is titled, Spiritual Vision and Blindness, by Pastor Jeff Ruby, dated November 19th, 2023. I have one routine in my life that has not varied since about fourth grade. And that routine is, every morning when I get up, I put contact lenses in my eyes to correct my vision so I have 20-20 vision. I had to get them at a pretty young age, but fortunately my vision wasn't really bad. It just needed a minor correction. And across the years, my vision has remained very stable. I have my annual eye exam. Everything's always good. Of course, a few years ago, in my mid-50s, I did need those things called reading glasses uh, for the fine print. But overall, my physical eyesight is in pretty good shape. Now, I'm not here this morning to talk about my physical eyesight or your physical eyesight, but I am here to talk this morning about our spiritual vision and also our spiritual blindness. And it all comes forth in this lesson that Gene just read. If you have a Bible with you or if you want to look it up on your phone, it's the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. And there in that text, there's a key paragraph in that Gospel that she just read that we need to understand. Jesus says, for judgment, for judgment, I have come into the world that those who are blind may see and those who see may become blind. Harsh words from Jesus. Difficult words. We can't dance around this gospel. What's the setting of this gospel? Jesus has just healed a man who was physically blind, but he healed him on the Sabbath, which was a no-fly zone for the Pharisees who said, you can't do this on the Sabbath, and they chewed Jesus out. And this is the context where he gets into this huge conflict, as he seemed to always be in, with these religious legalists. You see, here's the problem with the Pharisees. They saw so much that they were blind. They believed they had all the answers, so they never asked any questions of themselves. And they believed they were so right that they could never be wrong. So into this context, Jesus comes with this huge conflict. And he says these powerful words. These aren't words that are buddy-buddy words. Jesus walking up to us, putting his arm around us and saying, now there, Jeff, you're doing okay. You're doing a great job. I'm here to just comfort and love you. This is confrontation and this is challenge. And these are difficult words for us to hear today, but we need to hear them in light of our spiritual vision and in light of our blindness. So what does this mean? I think, first of all, in this ninth chapter of John, we need to see very clearly something. We need to see that we all have spiritual vision granted by God's grace, and yet we are at one and the same time spiritually blind. By virtue of being human, by virtue of being broken and sinful people, we have both this spiritual foresight and insight and vision, but yet we are also spiritually blind. What do I mean by this? How do I understand this? How do I understand it in my life? I'm going to share a few things with you about my own spiritual vision and my own spiritual blindness, and maybe some of them resonate with you, maybe not, but it's things that I've learned across the years because I think through the process of living, through simply the process of living, we all have our eyes open spiritually only by God's grace from time to time, but there's other times we are just dumb and spiritually blind and like the disciples, don't listen to Jesus. Here's what I've learned across many years. When I graduated from seminary, I believed I knew all the answers in here. I believed I knew all the answers to how God works in our lives. But after walking with people through pain and heartache and divorce and death and confusion and suicide and drug addiction and so many other things, I realize I don't even begin to know sometimes what the questions are. I've learned in my spiritual life and with my spiritual division, vision that I am by nature sinful, broken, unclean. And when I begin my prayer life 
with that acknowledgement, then it is much more powerful because I'm not trying to bluff God in terms of who I am and my relationship with him. I've learned that the only thing that I truly keep in life, the only thing I truly keep is what I give away. And all the things that we think will give us solace, material wealth, cars, homes, clothes, whatever it may be, all of that in the end is very meaningless. I've learned I have very, very, very little control over anything that happens to me in my life. We like to believe we do. We like to believe we have the illusion of control, but we have no control, and the only thing we can do is gauge how we respond out of God's love and mercy to the things that do happen for both good and for the negative. So those are some things I've learned, and across the years, those are some ways in which I've been able to see a little more clearly, to see a little more better in my spiritual life. But there's also that side of me that's still spiritually blind, like the disciples, like the Pharisees, because we're human. And what are some of those things? This is what I've experienced in my life. I've learned that I oftentimes see more of Jesus Christ in my life and what he wants me to do than what I'm willing to do. To do. And when I place him on the back burner, that's usually when things go south. I've learned that I oftentimes see more of myself and what I want rather than maybe listening to someone else and having a conversation and seeing how God is speaking and working through them because I'm so interested in my own agenda. I've learned that sometimes. I see more of other people, and when I see them, I'm not always willing to accept and love them unconditionally as I should. I judge them for their actions or their words. And in those ways, I am still spiritually blind. So what really is the key to all of this today? How do we live by God's grace? How do we understand God's grace? How is it? I think we all in our life, we all want more of that spiritual vision. We all desire. We're, we wouldn't be here today if we didn't love Jesus, if we didn't want to do more for him, if we didn't understand his role in our lives. But, but how do we do that and how do we overcome that blindness? It's only by God's grace. It's only by his love. And you know, we all have drawers or closets at home where we accumulate things, and maybe they have sentimental value, maybe they mean something to us, maybe they don't. But we don't go to that place often. We don't clean it out, we don't examine it, we don't open the drawer, we don't open the closet, we kind of let it go, we know we'll get to it someday. And the same is true of our spiritual life, if we're honest. In the face of Jesus Christ, when he says these difficult words today, for judgment, for judgment, I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will be blind. What does he mean by that? Well, people have misinterpreted this across the millennia. They believe he's speaking about the judgment at the end of all time when he chooses to end the world and bring us to himself. They think it's that kind of judgment. It's not that kind of judgment at all in the original Greek. The judgment that Jesus Christ is speaking about is the light that comes into your life and mine each and every day where we turn him aside. Those unexplained and and, and situations in our lives where we don't want to examine, where we don't want him in our life, where we push him out. Those dark corners of our soul, our unexamined opinions, our favorite prejudices, the old hurts and grudges that we hold. That's what he's talking about. For judgment, I have come into the world. And he is judging you and me. Not, thank God, our salvation, because we believe in his death and resurrection, and that's been granted to us. But he does come to us with his light and his love, and he forces us to grow. And here's what I find interesting. Here's what I really find interesting in life. 
Here's the thing. We understand this about everything in our life except our relationship with God. We understand this about everything. If you're a working person, you understand you have to keep up with the latest and greatest in your, your chosen field of vocation. You have to understand what's going on. Continuing education, knowing what's going on in your vocation, you have to keep up or you'll fall behind. So you develop and you grow and you push yourself. If you're trying to stay in shape, you understand that just doesn't happen by sitting in front of the TV with the remote and eating a lot of chips. It happens by working and developing and growing. And if you're using technology, if you're using technology, you're not using a computer from 1983. At least I hope you're not. (laughs) You're keeping up. Why is it that we do that with everything else? with everything else except our relationship with God. So this is where Jesus Christ confronts us. It's not a nice namby-pamby Jesus who's always making us feel good, but it is the Jesus who says, I want my light into your soul. I want my light in your life. Not just for an hour on Sunday mornings in the gathering place, but every day of our lives. Many years ago, the great composer, conductor, and pianist Beethoven was challenged by an upstart young pianist in Vienna named Stryberg. Stryberg challenged him to a competition on the piano, and they agreed to hold this in the home of one of Vienna's most wealthiest families. And the challenger was to go first, and then Beethoven was to go And so the challenger went and he played the piano beautifully. He had the music in front of him on the holder. Everything was wonderful. And then when he left, he brushed the music and it fell to the ground. And Beethoven, in order to absolutely humiliate his opponent, he took the music and he put it upside down and he transposed it and he played and he added to it and then he turned it sideways and then he turned it over so he couldn't even see the notes and he totally destroyed his challenger to the point that it humiliated him and he not only never challenged him again but he left Vienna because he was so ashamed. We have a master composer named Jesus Christ, who, thank God, does not humiliate us, who, thank God, does not treat us the way he should treat us for what we do, but who loves us and forgives us. And yet he still calls us to see more clearly. He still confronts us. For judgment, I have come into your life. We sing the familiar songs in this service and in our other services. We pray the familiar prayers, but he wants more. He wants you every hour of your life. And if you're not willing to give it, then he judges you. Not thankfully with the condemnation of hell, but by confronting us where we need to see more clearly. That's what it means for us personally, and I'm also going to throw out to you what this means for us as a community of faith. Because there is a confrontation and a challenge that Jesus brings to us as well. Each and every year, we literally are begging into December for blessed families in this congregation of thousands of people to adopt an angel tree family for poor children at our sister congregation in La Sagrada Familia. Due to the response at our first three services, we're down to our last 45 families. But there is no reason on God's green earth in this congregation of thousands that these children who can't afford gifts in their families should be left wanting. And today, we are going to have time between now and the luncheon and the reception for Janine, and we're going to have time if you have to leave worship and you can't attend that, and they will be right out those front doors, and there is no reason that if you haven't adopted a family that you don't pick one up, and if you can't physically shop for them, make a donation, and if you have, do more. My wife and I talked about this two days ago, and we're adopting another angel, even though we've already adopted a family and a food box, because it's important to us, because we've been blessed, and there is no reason This shouldn't happen. And there is no reason we should have to beg every year 
for this, for the Feed My Starving Children packing event, for helping our Bridge to Hope families, for our mission partnerships in Africa and Mexico, there is no reason that we should leave that unexamined in our lives and how God calls us to respond out of what he's given us. So here's the deal. The next time you go to the eye doctor, you're going to have an eye exam, and he or she's going to come in and tell you how your vision's doing. I'm leaving you with a question this morning. How's your spiritual vision? And are you seeing better all the time? Amen.